I'm Ann Barnett. My husband, Richard Barnett, was co-founder with Marcus Raskin of the Institute for Policy Studies, which now, in 2013, is celebrating its 50th year. My family and I have been part of IPS for the 50 years of its existence, and for this momentous anniversary, I'm going to record some of my personal reminiscences of IPS's early history. Dick, who died in 2004, would be very proud of the continuing good work that IPS does, teaches, and inspires. One person's view of IPS is, of course, incomplete. I add mine to the myriad of books, articles, pamphlets, curricula, newsletters, and internet entries that are readily available. By design, the Institute's independent scholar activists bring a wide range of viewpoints and projects to the progressive spirit that animates all of us. It provides space for new ideas in an often inhospitable climate, uh, welcoming diverse groups concerned with peace, justice, and inclusiveness. I've divided these reminiscences into eight short parts, with the first being a little biography of Dick and my pre-IPS days. Part one, Boston in the 1950s. 61 years ago, my Harvard classmate, uh, my Harvard Medical School classmate, David Nathan, introduced me to his best friend and distant relative, Dick Barnett, who was attending Harvard Law School. Dick and David had gone to nursery school together, grown up in suburban Boston, hiked in Europe together, and gone to Harvard College, from which Dick graduated summa cum laude. David told each of us that we would be perfect for the other and invited us both to the Valentine's Day party he was giving with Jean, his wife. However, as was typical for both Dick and me, and was to provide ample conflict in our 51 years together, I came late and he came early. So our times at the party did not overlap. Then, as always, Dick hated waiting around. He created another opportunity to meet by begging a pair of his Aunt Doretta's season tickets to the Metropolitan Opera's annual Boston tour, a very impressive blind date. I'd never been to the opera before. The wonderful double bill was Cavalleria Rusticana and E. Pagliacci, but we both were hardly conscious of the second opera because each was thinking of the other. This might be the one. And so it was. We were perfect. Dick and I got married in 1953 in his parents' Brookline living room with my minister father officiating. Three months later, I was pregnant and happy. Although we hadn't meant to have a baby right then, uh, there really was no convenient time in the near future that we could see to begin the family we both wanted. There's also much conversation among our friends about whether it was right to bring a child into a world of overpopulation and atom bombs. Dick was drafted into the army as a private the instant he finished law school. I still had a year of medical school to complete. Our daughter Julie arrived in 1954, the first child born to a female medical student uh, at Harvard. After Dick sleepwalk through basic training at Fort Dix in New Jersey, he was stationed at Fort Bragg, an army base in North Carolina. There were rumors that his unit was going to be sent to Korea. Although hostilities had ceased, large numbers of American soldiers were garrisoned there, and we found to our horror that dependents were not permitted in Korea. As the threat of being sent to Korea loomed larger, Dick took a commission as an army lawyer, 
this meant extending his term of service for a year, but it also meant we could be together. Thankfully, the medical school let me take some of my fourth year practical courses near his army base um, bases. In Fayetteville, North Carolina, I worked for the first time in a racially segregated hospital where, among other outrages, black premature babies were not permitted in the preemie nursery. Instead, their incubators were lined up in the hall outside the room that held the white babies. This was in 1954. In 1955, Rosa Park sat down in the front of her bus. I hadn't been paying much attention to the racism experienced by African Americans or to the stirrings of the civil rights struggle, but the absurd and shocking sight of an ill-lit hospital corridor lined with incubators containing tiny black babies turned me into a civil rights activist. Dick, now a first lieutenant, was sent to Heidelberg, Germany to help negotiate American troop withdrawal, and I joined him after I graduated, six months after the rest of the Harvard Medical School class of 1955. Beth, our second daughter, was born in an army hospital in Germany. Dick's scheduled assignment to Heidelberg had been two years, but it was cut short by news of his mother's grave illness. She had pemphigus, a life-threatening skin disease. We were not sure we would make it back in time for her to see her dear little Julie again, or to meet the new daughter, new granddaughter, who had been born in Germany, but we did get back in time. Dick's mother's life was saved by cortisone. She was one of the first pemphigus patients to be successfully treated. We hadn't had time to prepare for our re-entry into the employment world of Boston, but I got a, a position as a neurology fellow at the Massachusetts General Hospital and a job in the Cambridge Health Department. Uh, after our son Michael was born, we bought a nice old house in a Boston suburb where Julie and Beth entered nursery school. Dick got a job at Harvard Law School doing research on Stanley Surrey's International Tax Law Project. And then he took a slightly better uh, paying job as an associate tax lawyer in the stuffy old Boston law firm of Choate Hall and Stewart. He enjoyed helping elderly widows with their trusts, exhibiting a competence that amazed me since he could not balance our checkbook. Um, but soon he got bored with taxes and started to hang out whenever he could at Harvard's Russian Research Center. He had majored in Russian literature as a Harvard undergraduate and had become passionately concerned with Cold War politics. Dick wrote a long monograph on the history of U.S.-Soviet military arms negotiations. Periodically, beginning soon after the end of World War II, Dick wrote, the Cold War heated up to dangerously near the boiling point. Both sides threatened to use nuclear weapons. The U.S. position was that the Soviets were intransigent and dishonest. dishonest. Dick's position was rather more even-handed. Both sides were putting the world at risk of nuclear war. Will Polk, an editor at Boston's Beacon Press, helped him turn the uh, paper into a book called Who Wants Disarmament? Shortly after its publication, Dick received a phone call from one of John Kennedy's young assistants. President-elect Kennedy had read the book, and he pressed Dick to come to Washington to help start a disarmament program within the new administration. We didn't have much of a discussion about whether or not to go. Dick had always encouraged me and supported my career, but we had a 50s marriage. Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique wasn't published until 1963. When something had to give, the assumption was 
it would be the good wife. Part 2. Camelot ends and the Institute begins. With other newcomers to political Washington at the edge of the 60s, we were swept up in the mood of excitement and hope. Though several, several layers removed from the glamorous folk of Camelot, Dick occasionally attended meetings with President Kennedy, and his presidential appointment met the meant that our names appeared on a few fancy invitation lists. The closest I got to the Kennedys was sharing Jacqueline's hairdresser. All of us youngish women fixed our hair like Jackie's. Our two-year-old, Michael, was invited to be part of Carolyn Kennedy's nursery school at the White House. In spite of our regret at foregoing the attraction of dining out on White House tidbits to be gleaned through the nursery school connection, we declined. With both of us working, it would have been too much effort to transport our son from the house we rented at the edge of the District of Columbia down to the White House and back. Besides, I was afraid Mike would bite Carolyn. It was only a stage, but he happened to be in it. Thinking we would stay in Washington only a couple of years, we had rented a house in nearby Maryland. The two younger children entered nursery school and Julie started first grade. I got a job on a project funded through the Washington School of Psychiatry studying the developing electrical activity of eye and brain, continuing a research interest I had developed in medical school. My laboratory was at the Maryland Forest Glen Annex of the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Dick worked long hours at the State Department. I intersected with his work life through the big receptions to which we were invited. They usually made me uncomfortable, and not only because of the cigarette smoke. Uh, job status was the only thing that made one interesting in the intensely male social hierarchy of official Washington. I had seen Dick being stiffed by some assistant cabinet officer or a two-star general whose roaming eyes had alighted upon a more important conversational quarry. Washingtonians always seemed to be casting about for somebody more important. I wasn't even in the game. Even though I didn't want to be a player, I would have preferred being the one doing the rejecting rather than having no choice in the matter. Women who were not gorgeous, seductive, or very rich were invisible. Most people assumed a woman was just a housewife, just a woman. Schools and children, topics I enjoyed, were as unmentionable in mixed company um, as sex. Washington dinner parties still divided after dessert. The women were shunted away from the table so the men could discuss important topics over their liqueurs. I was forced to give these parties too, although I wheedled my way out of as many as possible. Panic gripped me for days before each occasion as I obsessively studied the joy of cooking. Would my quiche hors d'oeuvres, boeuf bourguignon, herb rice, endive salad, and creme brulee pass muster? Although I scorned them, I simultaneously tried to emulate successful Washingtons, Washingtonians. Important people, they managed their lives and the lives of others, held together by a patchwork of self-importance, polished image, money, and a very, very long list of responsibilities. Dick promptly lost his illusions about our government's commitment to significant arms reduction. The military-industrial complex of the post-war Eisenhower years was a juggernaut which, uh, whose momentum Kennedy apparently was unwilling or unable to control. Dick's gloom was deepened by the near-miss nuclear confrontation with the Soviets during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. 
his growing conviction that the cause of nuclear disarmament required independent advocates outside the, outside the halls of power was crowned by a moment of truth which occurred during a high-level State Department meeting filled with defense industry executives and generals. He listened as a senior official solemnly stated, gentlemen, if this group cannot bring about disarmament, no one can. Between laughter and tears, Dick glanced around the crowded room to see if anyone else was dismayed by the statement. And he caught the eye of a young stranger and they sought each other out during the break. Marcus Raskin was a 30-year-old White House assistant who was assigned to work on national security issues. Both Dick and Mark soon resigned their government posts in order to form an independent group empowered to think about public policies unconstrained by being on the government's payroll. For the next year, the group that was to become the Institute for Policy Studies met in our living room. Besides Dick and Mark, I recall Gar Alperwitz, uh, Arthur Waskow, uh, Sandy Jenks, Don Michaels, and Stephen Muller. Uh, uh, perhaps Rob Burledge and others may have attended sometimes. All agreed that in the fearfully uncertain period after President Kennedy's assassination, an independent voice on public policy was more important than ever. Part three, the Vietnam War. In the 60s and early 70s, as the Vietnam War heated up, our whole family became active in the growing anti-war effort. The Institute for Policy Studies was an unofficial center of anti-war activities. Mark Raskin co-wrote a critique of the growing U.S. involvement in Indochina with the journalist Bernard Fall. Their compendium of essential writings on Vietnam, The Vietnam Reader, published in 1965, was widely used for teach-ins in universities across the country. Bernard Fall was killed in Indochina in 1967. Prior to his death, I couldn't have found Vietnam on a map. In 1968, Mark was arrested with Dr. Benjamin Spock, Reverend William Stone, Sloan Coffin, Michael Ferber, and Mitchell Goodman on the charge of counseling young men to burn their draft cards. Arrest. It felt very close to home. Our family and Mark's were best friends. All of the defendants had been at the Institute and had visited our home. Dick and Pil Bill Coffin played chamber music together and had worked on peace issues with IPS board member Cara Weiss and other friends. Dr. Spock was my baby book guru. He also was the authority on raising babies for Jacqueline Kennedy and a million other women. In 1971, our three children, ages 12, 14, and 16, attended a huge anti-war, anti-Vietnam War demonstration. With thousands of others, they were arrested and hauled off to Washington's baseball stadium. When our children, children hadn't arrived home on schedule, we went out to search for them. The television news had informed us of, its, of the mass confinements in the stadium. We were much relieved to see our youngest, Michael, on the other side of a barbed wire fence, smiling and waving, the braces on his teeth glinting. Dr. Spock was holding his hand. Our girls were in another temporary holding area, safe and singing. All we are saying is give peace a chance. I recall that Dick and I were standing next to Abner Mikva, whose daughter was also on the other side of the barbed wire. We tossed peanut butter sandwiches and warm jackets over the fence. 
Walter Reed was becoming a less than comfortable place to carry out my medical research. Dr. David Riach, my boss at uh, Walter Reed, was also quietly anti-war, and he shepherded my first research grant through the National Institutes of Health, and armed with that financial support, I moved my entire research laboratory to Washington's Children's Hospital. I was volunteering with the Committee of Responsibility, a small organization of anti-war physicians that sponsored care in the United States for Vietnamese children whose traumatic injuries could not be treated adequately in Vietnam. Sometimes our extra bedroom at home was used by a war-injured Vietnamese boy between his treatments at Washington's Children's Hospital. I still maintain friendly but informal relations with my colleagues at Walter Reed. One of the teenage boys I was helping to care for was undergoing treatment at Children's Hospital for horrible burn scars. Both of his ears had been burned off, along with much of his scalp. One of his eardrums was intact and he could hear. For over a year, I took the boy to the bio biomechanical laboratory in a trailer at Walter Reed, where specialists in the manufacture of prostheses worked long hours making and fitting him with a wig that was attached to artificial ears. More than once I found the boy crying, unwilling to get out of bed. No one will marry him, a, v a Vietnamese friend explained. He is too ugly. Part four. The Institute grows and has some growing pains. Keeping IPS going was always demanding and often consuming. Decisions were arrived at mainly by a democratic process of consensus building among fellows and board, which on a few occasions were spectacularly unsuccessful. Dick and Mark handled their many tasks with amazing grace, uh, although watching them sometimes gave me a headache. Dick was writing book after book, article after article, and was traveling, it seemed, all the time. Fundraising, speaking, consulting, talking about his books in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and in between. He traveled to Moscow for Leo Szilard's Pugwash conferences, to the Netherlands on Transnational Institute Affairs, to Paris for Vietnam peace meetings, to Australia for a lecture tour, to Afghanistan with Ekbal Ahmed for a New Yorker article on the Soviet-Afghan war, and to, the Al to Algeria and the Middle East for his work on energy resources, to Spain for lectures, to China to speak at their peace institute, to Central and South America to meet with progressives. We met many wonderful people who became lifelong friends. Cora and Peter Weiss, Phil Stern, the Bernstein and Jantz families, Dan Ellsberg, Ekel Ekbal, Ahmed, Ralph Nader, Susan George, and many others who shared and expanded the vision and made it their own. I tagged along on some of the travel, but sometimes anti-social me found the obligatory um, social events a chore. IPS was hospitable to a wide range of opinion, often controversial, on war and peace, economic policies, civil rights, black power, feminism, and more, and tempers could run high. Then too, we assumed, correctly it turned out, that there were informers and provocateurs swarming about dressed in t-shirts, peasant blouses, and jeans like the rest of us. I felt sorry later about a few blameless folk 
who came under suspicion, likely because they combed their hair and wore pressed khakis. But the phones really were tapped and wastebaskets examined and Dick was on Nixon's enemy list. Part 5. IPS and a Social Invention Our son Mike hated school. When it came time for him to enter middle school, we began to look around for alternatives. Finding none, we started meeting with a group of other Washington parents who were dissatisfied both with Washington's public schools and its elite private schools, the former because of their poor educational quality and the latter because they were um, undemocratic and unaffordable. At the time, talk of no new social forms and structures that we were calling social inventions buzzed around the Institute for Policy Studies. Ronnie Moffitt's music carryout was one of these, a storefront uh, where neighborhood kids could borrow musical instruments, get free lessons, and make music together. Our parents' group conceived of the idea of a new school in which the resources of the city would be the tools for education, the museums, the dark room at the National Geographic, the streets, the government agencies, the parks. Ivan Illich, the idiosyncratic priest who wrote Deschooling Society, and Paul Goodman, who wrote Growing Up Absurd, were part of the group we enlisted to help us invent education for change for our 10 to 14 year olds. We named our school the Forum School, although the kids called it the Reform School. It was headquartered for a time in St. Albans Church on the grounds of the Washington Cathedral, but the city was the classroom. In its six-year history, it shepherded about 30 boys and girls through the middle school years. They were a diverse lot, half black, half white, some extremely privileged, and others welfare recipients. They taught one another as much as they learned in more academic uh, interactions. Many of them are still close friends 40 years later. The school nearly foundered at its inception when one street urchin organized a sh shoplifting ring among the students that targeted the ladies uh, church guild opportunity shop. Uh, it was located on the cathedral grounds near the school. We averted complete disaster through a semester-long compulsory ethics and responsibility class co-taught by one of the clergymen of the cathedral and a forum school teacher. Our family found ourselves caught up in Washington's mood of nervous excitement. Dick had gone to North Vietnam and then written some magazine articles on the possibilities for resolving the endless Vietnam conflict, and now he was on President Nixon's enemies list. The Institute's phone, phones were tapped, and we suspected that our phone at home was monitored as well. We wished them a good dose of our teenagers' interminable conversations. Julie had just graduated from sedate Quaker Sidwell Friends School. However, we were not pleased to learn that she was musing about spending full time in anti-war activities instead of going to college. The prospect of her becoming more engaged in the craziness, drugs, dirt, and disorder repelled me in spite of my sympathy with her desire to make a new and better world. I also was afraid of some of the wild, oh, the wild current in some of the movement's heroes. Drugs were my main fear. They fueled some of the young people attracted to the anti-war movement. The music, the hair, the tie-dye clothes, the communal love feasts, the joy in being young, free, and spaced out, all were infused with marijuana. Although neither did or I think there's much harm in marijuana for adults, we were afraid of possible uh, harm to growing brains, 
Michael was only 10 years old in 1968. And on the streets of Georgetown and DuPont Circle, one could see swarming young people who had expanded their consciousness beyond some limit. Lovely, vacant-eyed, dirty flower children. Section 6, Mexico. The 60s and 70s in Washington and around the world were full of turbulent, often exhilarating change. The Institute was in the thick of things, but the war, the murders of Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy, and the riots, resentment, and burning in the inner cities, including Washington, left a pall of ashes on our hopes. There was too much frantic activity at the Institute for Dick to make the progress he wanted on the book he was writing and I wanted to concentrate on my brain research. We could do with a change of scene. The chance came up to spend a year in Mexico City, and we grabbed it. Dick would work on his book on globalization and do some teaching at the university. I received grants from the NIH and the William T. Grant Foundation to investigate the effects of malnutrition on infants' brain function using the EEG of Te response techniques I had developed in my Washington laboratory. Our children were intrigued with the idea of immersing themselves in a new language and culture. Julie could develop her interests in art and anthropology at the superb museum school affiliated with UNAM, the university in Mexico City. Our 15-year-old Beth was excited about trying school in Spanish and Michael thought he might like genuine Mexican food. In 1972, our family left gray wintertime Washington, edgy with Vietnam and Nixon. We drove our blue Ford station wagon south for 10 days until we arrived in a Mexico City sparkling with millions of Christmas lights. Along our meandering way, we visited my mother's birthplace in Kentucky and Antoine's restaurant in New Orleans, where we celebrated Beth's 16th birthday. Mexico City vibrated with color and sound. Costume mariachi bands blared. Street musicians were playing reed pipes and gourds. As we strolled through Tlatelolco, the square were hundreds, hundreds, perhaps thousands, of student press protesters had been massacred by government thugs only a few years before. We suffered it, only a pickpocketed wallet. On the sidewalks, amid the Christmas th throngs, stolid Indian women sat in colorful heaps, nursing infants swaddled in soft, faded rebosos. The women don't tell us that they're hungry anemic and vitamin deficient. Their dirty-faced toddlers stand nearby holding out chiclets in their open palms to sell. The child to whom one gives a coin looks to be about three years old, but actually she is six. As if to signal the impermanence of the monstrous city, once in a while the ground beneath our feet trembled. After we all took a fast Spanish course, our teenage girls enrolled in Mexican schools. Our youngest, Mike, went to the American school. Dick was writing Global Reach, a book about the profound changes in the world brought about by multinational corporations and their influences on the global flow of goods, money, uh, resources, culture, and people. Every day, I drove south across the city to my laboratory at the Children's Hospital. The streets were clogged with 50s Chevys, belching pollution from their exhaust pipes. All transpor transportation was unbearably overcrowded, and nobody got anywhere on time. The air was thin, dusty, and unbreathable, except on those wonderful days when the sky was brilliant blue and the snow caught capped peaks of the twin volcanoes 
shined above the city. Stanley and Lisa Weiss, friends and benefactors to IPS, who resided part-time in Mexico City, happened to be in England for the year. They lent us their beautiful house in Las Lomas, one of Mexico City's fine old districts. The quiet streets of our neighborhood, shaded by flowering trees, were patrolled by an ancient watchman armed with a bow and arrow. He would call out a greeting as we passed by on our evening walks. We soon learned this was an invitation to drop a few pesos into the worn red leather pouch he wore slung over his shoulders. Our borrowed house came complete with maids, a cook, gardeners, and a chauffeur. Sharp glass shards embedded on top of the high walls of the uh, surrounding the compound protected our uh, residents from intruders undeterred by the bow and arrow man. Our wealthy friends were accustomed to servants. I didn't know what to do with them. Once I asked a maid to help carry some things from the car and she refused because it was the chauffeur's job. I brought one of the young maids a glass of iced tea when she was sick with a fever. Her low ceiling cubicle in the servants' annex looked as if it was built for very short people. Actually, many of the servants were short, perhaps due to chronic malnutrition. I was reminded of the 18th century, uh, century frescoes that I had seen recently in a colonial, you know, colonial church in which the humble servant folks were painted to a smaller scale than the saints and nobility. Our politically progressive, liberation theology-minded family was uneasy. We lived the contradictions and felt like guilty bystanders. I worked at Mexico City's Children's Hospital with the poorest of the poor, children half dead of starvation. The book was reading, uh, writing Global Reach, examined economic globalization and its heavy consequences for the poor. Life and death urgencies pressed all around us as we wrote our books, did our research, ate excellent food prepared by our cook, shopped in the exclusive and expensive Zona Rosa, traveled to Acapulco and Tikal, and sent our children to private schools. Only our older daughter, Julie, plunged right in. Having graduated from high school in Washington, she enrolled in the political science department of Mexico City's huge public university. There she was swept up in the swirl of radical student politics while we worried about her safety. Not only did she march and go on strike, Elga, with her fellow students, but she became a volunteer teacher in a prepa popular, a high school started by university students to accommodate some of the thousands of youth without a place in Mexico's overcrowded school system. Young people were pouring into the capitals of third world cities around the world, repelled by the drab and hard scrabble life in the countryside that afforded meager opportunities for education or work. Youth was p pulled as if by magnets to urban centers. Although in the end most found little in the city to fulfill their dreams, it gave them an illusion of freedom and a few of the smartest and most fortunate found a measure of security and space for their adventurous spirits. In Mexico, the Prepa Popular, the People's School, was one such space invented out of necessity by young people and feared by the authorities as leftist. Julie met with her classes in an empty warehouse that had been informally appropriated from uh, and but which borrowed its electricity by running wires from a street lamp turned they turned it on and off by clipping two wires together. Thousands of students attended classes in shifts and at several locations. 
Pupils and instructors help to support the school by organizing themselves as dance bands, peddlers, and street singers. Julie sang on buses and street corners with her fellow teachers and students to collect pesos for the school. She was part of a student movement that was active all over the world in the 60s and 70s. Belief that political redemption would come through revolution was in the air. Anti-colonialism was the watchword. There were unending, passionate meetings, leafletings, strikes, and demonstrations about independence, cultural autonomy, self-determination for Latin America, and freedom from exploitation by the giant to the north. It was in those years, I believe, that Julie was appointed associate fellow at IPS. Part 7, Traveling the Pan-American Highway. In the 1970s and 80s, Dick and I were consultants to international programs that sought to improve child health in Latin America. The general thrust of my end of the project was to try to put in place methods uh, to monitor the brain and behavioral development of children suffering from malnutrition so that the uh, effects of various therapies could be properly um, evaluated. I hope that my advice and expertise somewhat balance the expenses of my paid-for trips to some of the world's poorest and most beautiful places. Getting food to people was much more urgent in my mind than developing these countries' capacities, capacities for the high-tech diagnostic medicine that I practice. Perhaps my uh, reservations were condescending. Uh, certainly, my uh, in-country colleagues were thirsting for the advanced technology paid for by our UN grants, and the development dollars were theirs to spend. During our sojourn in Mexico, we often traveled as a family to some of the project sites uh, at our own expense, I should add. On one such occasion, we all took to the road to visit maternal and child health facilities of the Pan American Health Organization in rural Guatemala. We drove down the grandly named pothole pocked Pan American Highway on our way to one of the health stations. We drove slowly, pulling over often, in part uh, glad for the chance to look around at the spectacular mountains, but really because, really because we were intimidated by the heart-stopping speed of the rackety trucks and buses that tore past us on blind curves. Dick slowed our station wagon as we entered the dense, uh, dusty central plaza of a highland Guatemalan vi village, empty at the noon siesta except for the usual yellow dogs asleep in the sliver of shade at the side of the dry fountain. A loud blast of music assaulted our ears in the moment that a motorcycle spun out of an alley and glanced off of our car. The cyclist was flung on the hood of the car. As our frightened family uh, exited the car, the young man groaned loudly. Approaching from the other side of the car was a square, pot-bellied man in a wrinkled blue uniform who identified himself as the police chief. I saw the whole thing, he said. Clara, you were at fault. He said he would call a doctor. The cyclist staggered into the police station with his boom box. We waited. After a while, we told him we wanted to go in order to get to our destination 100 kilometers ahead before dark. The cyclist seemed uninjured. The children needed their supper. The chief looked doubtful. Then he was strung with a brilliant idea. You give money for the doctor. You give the motorcycle boy money for his repairs. Then go. 
We forked over some dollars, feeling like pigeons who had gotten off rather easily. A scam of this sort could have happened in New York or many other places, but our sense of being unprotected by the officials in charge of law enforcement was um, unsettling, a violation of our North American invulnerability. I was for the most part unaware at that time of the violence that was part of the fabric of Guatemalan life. We knew something of the country's dark history of the rapacious, racist conquest of the indigenous peoples by the Europeans during colonization, of the massacres, the epidemics, the enslavement. But I thought of that period as past history. But in fact, thousands upon thousands of Guatemalans and other Central Americans were being victimized in the second half of the 20th century by the armies and death squads of repressive governments. In its report of 1979, for example, Amnesty International uh, talked, uh, declared that 50 to 60,000 Guatemalans were killed in the previous years. And the political violence and killings continued for decades more. Guatemalans, Salvadorans, Hondurans, hundreds of thousands died in the violence. Down a mountainside, we arrived at the village nutrition station, surrounded by coffee plantations, fincas. There, a nurse told us the story of a local owner of a large plantation who had recently made the effort to modernize. His workers were indentured servants, she told us, almost slaves. All of the fincas have Indians working them who are close to slaves. This progressive landowner replaced his workers' shacks with cement block houses, opened a health clinic, and doubled his workers' wages to about two dollars a day. This last move proved his undoing. At the first new payday, Raiders shot up the pay station, killing two, and that night the owner's hacienda was set ablaze. The landowner received little sympathy from his peers. In fact, they were likely the perpetrators. What other response to his Marxist foolishness did he expect? Change came hard to the region. Relentless globalization was causing rapid alterations in traditional ways of life. Less food was being grown in home gardens, and more and more was coming from supermarkets supplied by large industrialized food factories. Peasants learned to value packaged foods and national brands over local produce. Large corporations bought out local owners. The big boss of the happy coffee bean picker of the ads was a corporate executive in Miami or Chicago. Acres of carnations and roses were cut and boxed for export by Guatemalans who no longer grew their own beans and rice. A mother's switch from breast milk to commercially produced breast milk substitutes uh, produced a world away was just another instance of the chain, changeover from local production to food prepared far away, which required a cash purchase and led to heightened food insecurity for the poor. The poverty and violence fueled exodus. Luis, a young Guatemalan whom I later met at my church in Washington, told me why he left. My brother was an organizer of indigenous Native Americans. He was disappeared. When he didn't come home, my mom said, get out, get out. She couldn't read or write or even speak a more, uh, more than a few words of Spanish. We spoke a Mayan language, but she understood along with our whole town what was going on. That same night, I crossed the border to Mexico by a secret path we all knew. Everyone was trying to get to the United States. Some made their way to Washington, D.C., 
where they found the family place, the community center I started with my fellow Church of the Savior members in response to the needs of refugees and their families. Our family returned from the year in Latin America to re-enter our usual lives. Beth graduated from high school and entered Grinnell College, and Mike was getting along well in high school. The sojourn in Mexico had sparked his interest in school. Julie started college at the University of Wisconsin, but when she went to visit her boyfriend in Mexico during the Christmas break, she stayed. Dick's book, Global Reach, co-authored with Ron Mueller, was published, and he started on the next one. Sometimes I joined him on his book tours. I joined, in fact, the Infant Formula Action Coalition, an international grassroots coalition formed to fight worldwide corporate practices that discourage breastfeeding by supplying free samples of infant formula to maternity hospitals and to mothers of newborn babies. None of the babies in my malnutrition research had been breastfed for more than two weeks. I believe that in those years I was an associate fellow of IPS. With other advocates and experts, I spoke at various meetings and conferences about what I had seen in Mexico and Latin America. I testified before a U.S. Senate committee provided over by Senator Kennedy, uh, where I told the story of corporate influences on infant feeding practices, how saleswomen dressed up in white uniforms to look like nurses visited new mothers in maternity wards to tout the advantages of infant formula. New mothers would try the free formula and the consequence was that their own breast milk would dry up. I recited statistics on the deaths that could be prevented through breastfeeding. Through the efforts of persistent activists, an international code of marketing for breast milk substitutes was adopted by the UN World Health Assembly in 1981. The code ratified by 118 member nations, not including the US, called for prohibiting the advertising of baby formula for newborns to the public, forbidding maternity hospital visits to promote formula feeding, and discontinuing free formula distribution in maternity clinics and hospitals. This good outcome would not have been possible without persistent local actions, advocacy, and monitoring in many countries, much of it led by religiously inspired social justice groups. Part 8, Orlando. As I look back, I see years pockmarked by violent death. On September 21st, 1976, we were shaken by the deaths of two friends, IPS colleagues, Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Moffat. Orlando Letelier had held high positions in the socialist government of uh, uh, Chile, headed by President Salvador Allende. Letelier had been uh, Chile's ambassador to the United States, and he was defense minister at the time that Allende was deposed by a right-wing military coup under the leadership of Augusto Pinochet, an army general. Letelier was imprisoned and tortured. After an international outcry, he was released and exiled. Letelier and his, and his family moved to Washington, D.C., where the Institute for Policy Studies appointed him senior fellow, and then to the Transnational Institute, uh, one of the offspring of IPS. Dick worked closely with Orlando, and four months earlier, we had all attended the wedding in her parents' backyard in New Jersey of Ronnie 
Moffitt to Michael Moffitt. Um, her husband, Michael, was Dick's research assistant, and Ronnie worked in the development office at IPS. She also was responsible for one of IPS's social inventions, the music carry-out, that loaned musical instruments to poor kids. The young couple happened to be commuting to IPS with Letelier on the morning of September 21st because their own car was in the shop for repairs. It called me uh, at my office at Children's Hospital. Orlando and Ronnie, he was choked, could barely talk. He said they're dead, killed. Their car had exploded on beautiful, tree-shaded Massachusetts Avenue, a wide street lined by embassies and a convenient route to the IPS building in DuPont Circle. I drove the few miles from Children's Hospital to George Washington University Hospital. Outside the emergency department, I entered the restroom in order to wash my tear street face. There I found Orlando's wife, Isabel, alone at the mirror trying to fix her smudged eye makeup. And he's He's dead, you know, she whispered. We embraced. My clothes are all wrong. She numbly, numbly stared at herself in the mirror. Before she'd learned of the cataclysm, she'd been getting ready for a lunch at the gallery that exhibited her paintings. And she was wearing tight black leather pants black boots, and a short black leather jacket. You look perfect, I tried to reassure her, and her expression softened. They won't let me back to see him, she said. Let's go, I replied, and I guided her swiftly past two nurses and a resident physician who made feeble stay away gestures. The hospital was waiting for the official medical examiners to arrive. My discovery that I was not too timid to break a rule for a friend gave me a moment's grim cheer. The trauma room, a large high ceiling space lit by harsh overhead lamps, was empty except for the two stretchers. We walked over to one of them. Do you want to see him? She nodded. I drew down the cover from his face. As I withdrew to give her privacy, my eyes were drawn involuntarily to the flat of the stretcher over his lower body, where the ridges of his legs should have been. They had both been blown away. Ronnie was lying under a white sheet on the second stretch stretcher. I knew that it was Ronnie because her long, smooth, shining dark hair was hanging over the edge of the stretcher. Someone had thought to comb it for her. The Chilean secret police were behind the assassinations of leaders of the resistance to the Pinochet dictatorship. Norlando was a leader among them. Ronnie was, in the phrase we learned during the Vietnam War, collateral damage. IPS fellow Saul Lando worked stubbornly and never stopping with police and FBI to discover the perpetrators and bring them to justice and to unravel and uncover the international web of conspirators up to and including General Pinochet, the dictator. Eight conspirators were indicted in U.S. court in 1978. They were convicted, but served very little jail time. This remarkable story is recounted in the book Saul wrote with John Dingus, 
assassination on Embassy Row. And recently, this year, in Saul's interview posted on the internet. In 1978, a civil lawsuit for wrongful death was filed in federal district court by the Lotelier and Moffitt families against defendants, which included the government of Chile. Uh, their lawyers asked me to testify as to my opinion of the experiences of Orlando and Ronnie in the moments after the car bomb exploded. Neither died immediately. Orlando, who had been driving, was wedged under the steering wheel, legs blown off. Ronnie staggered from the car. Her husband, Michael, who had been ejected from the car by the force of the explosion, helped her to the grass of Sheridan Circle and then turned to try to help Orlando. When he turned back in the next moment, he found her bleeding from a severed artery in her neck. She drowned in her own blood. The shock and horror are unimaginable. The government of Chile paid out under the lawsuit uh, a settlement in the early 1990s after Chile's transition to democracy that even a semblance of justice was done was due in large part to the persistent investigative efforts backed by IPS. Ideas and action has been the guiding principle of the Institute for 50 years. Its vital witness continues to this day. My family and I are privileged to be a part of it, and we hope for the next 50 years. Thanks.